Welcome back, everyone. We're so happy that you're able to join us. Now, people are tuning in, so I'll give it just a minute or two to let everyone get signed in. <clears throat> I love seeing the numbers tick up. Welcome everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. We have a lot to cover this second hour. We're very excited about our presentations. We ran out of time the last session and I just wanted to give a little bit of um, more, a little bit more information about the improvement science session and how it relates to the initiatives that are proceeding with potential use of ARPA funds. And so um, Nathan Didino has offered to be on and talk a little bit more about that. So Nathan, I'm going to hand it over to you. Sure. Thank you, Susan. And I'll keep this brief because I know that many of you want to um, get to our next, I think, probably more exciting presentation. Um, but about half of you um, uh, have uh, come from a county that are interested in um, doing something with the local oversight um, part of the ARPA priorities. Um, and um, as you know, um, as part of that, we're looking at something using implementation science, um, just to anticipate any other questions, improvement science, improvement strategies that Marilyn talked today are also uh, perfectly acceptable under the, um, the ARPA grant. Um, so um, we kind of gave this presentation to you in part with uh, Marilyn and our friends at OACB to, to whet your appetite and uh, get, you, get you started um, thinking maybe a little bit more even than um, you, you have. Um, these are the sorts of things that we're going to be um, interested in and working with you and supporting you in doing. Um, we're looking at um, having Marilyn available in the upcoming year, year and a half. Um, to be able to provide some additional training and support to counties that are pursuing um, this ARPA priority. Um, I, I'm particularly excited about this one. And I, I think that it really, the fact that half, more than half of counties um, have looked at doing one of these activities um, speaks to really the seriousness with which um, all of you are, are looking at your local systems and finding ways to improve that. So, so kudos to, um, to all of you who are doing that. Just a very quick reminder, we did post all of the grant, the ARPA grant materials to the EI website. Um, earlier this week, we did have that issue with the PDF versus Word version of the grant agreement that's been resolved. Um, so we did email that to folks, but it's also um, available on the website now too. So stay tuned. Uh, we'll be continuing to, to talk about um, all three of our ARPA priorities in the, the coming weeks and months. Everything is due back November 15th um, in GMS or to your um, program consultant. If you're having any issues uh, meeting that deadline, do please reach out to your EI um, program consultant so that at least we're aware and we can work with you to determine a plan B. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Beth Popich to get us uh, started to the real reason why all of you came today. Okie doke. Thank you, Nathan. Um, again, just to go over quickly the CPDU process. Um, first of all, we are you are all muted because we're on a webinar um, and your cameras are off. But the way to communicate is through the chat and through the Q&A that you can see at the bottom of your screen. Um, for folks who are seeking PDUs, you will have already signed up in Member Connect and you will, they will be available within 24 to 48 hours. And for groups of you who are attending, who are seeking CPDUs for each individual person, if you would please at the end of this session, uh, submit an attendance uh, form to training at oacbdd.org. 
and that will trigger the process for each person receiving their CPDUs. And now I am honored to present to you Angela Hanscom. She's a pediatric OT and author of Balanced and Barefoot, How Unrestricted Outdoor Play Makes for Strong, Confident, and Capable Children. Angela? All right. Um, I'm super excited to be here with you guys today. And I'm going to actually go ahead and pull up my screen so you have a visual to look at. And today we're going to talk about um, what's going on with children in the past uh, 30 years. And it's really been highlighted actually through the pandemic. So this presentation, I feel like, is very timely um, on, you know, the reduction of outdoor play and how it's really affecting development in children in ways that we really never anticipated. Um, I'm going to start with uh, how I began this work because it will lay the foundation for the rest of the talk. Um, so this is my family. This picture I need to update. It's a little old. Uh, my oldest daughter is 16. My middle daughter is 13 and I have a son who's six years old. So this is a little outdated. And that's my husband, Paul. I always start my presentations with an image of my family because the work of um, Timbernook, um, which I'll talk about in a minute, and the book, Balance and Barefoot, all of that came about um, once I became a parent and it became very meaningful to me to get children outdoors again. So really um, it's not traditional as most of you know. I know there's a lot of therapists on this, um, on here right now. Um, it's not necessarily traditional for an occupational therapist to be outdoors um, working with children in the woods. So. Um, and this was not, nothing I had planned, um, but kind of one thing happened another in, in my life that got me on this path. Um, so one of the big things um, that happened was I started to, I guess, first, let me back up. I've worked in all different settings. So I worked in early childhood settings. I've worked, um, I've actually worked with preemies when they first go home. I worked in hospitals, um, schools. Uh, I've worked at on rehab unit, and um, but most of my experience actually was outpatient therapy before I began this work. And what happened um, was I started just paying attention um, to what was happening around me. So one thing that happened was I remember working in a clinic where there was a huge need for occupational therapy. And we kept hiring more and more occupational therapists, but we couldn't keep up with the demand for children. We had a wait list that went out at least a year before we could get to the next child. Um, so I really, that was something that really hit me. There was an article for New York Times about the rise in the need for occupational therapy in the past 10 years in three major cities. Um, a lot of therapists in schools were getting overwhelmed. They just couldn't meet the caseloads. So that was very interesting to me. My own daughter was four, about to turn five. And I also recognized that a lot of her friends were receiving occupational therapy. And I kept thinking, why, why the rise in occupational therapy? Uh, you know, when I grew up in the early 80s, it, it was really more reserved for children with more severe disabilities. So I just was fascinated by that. And then um, I remember treating a child um, and uh, he came in to the clinic setting and he didn't like wind in his face. And I remember thinking, how do I treat that in a clinic setting? Um, should I get a fan and blow the wind on his face? You know, really struggling with how to treat some of these issues indoors. Uh, a lot of kids not wanting to get dirty, um, but the number one issue was that kids were um, becoming more and more clumsy. So, um, you know, kids were falling out of their chairs. So I started hearing teachers report that kids were literally falling out of the chairs and onto the ground in school, um, you know, having more accidents on playgrounds. And um, so I, I kept filing this information away. Finally, my um, second daughter was born and I decided I was gonna stay home and raise my children. I had no plans to work or even be a manager of anything, Never mind, run, um, a, a program like this. Uh, we're now um, in four countries. So this is, again, not was not my idea. 
Um, so I was going to stay home and enjoy their childhood and as for as long as possible. And what happened was my daughter, when she turned five that summer, it was time for kindergarten. We met with the teacher ahead of time, uh, all the parents before the kids even went to school. And that teacher looked at us and said, this is not kindergarten like you remember um, growing up. She said, this is really more like first grade. We are not, we don't have time to teach your children how to cut with scissors. My husband's gonna pre-cut everything at nighttime, she said, so that we don't have to worry about that skill. Then she said, if they can't wear, um, they can't tie their shoes, please put elastic laces on or Velcro because we will not have time to teach your children how to tie their shoes. Then she said, we have five minutes for snack, but if that becomes an issue um, and it gets in the way of curriculum, it will become a working snack. Finally, she said, 15 minutes for recess. However, when it snows, so I live in New Hampshire where there's snow most of the, you know, or a good portion of the school year, she said, we will um, have indoor recess because we do not have time to change your children into their snow gear. So this whole theme of no time for developmental skills kept coming up. And as an occupational therapist that works on development, um, this, this really did not sit right for me. So, but I did wanna give it an opportunity. I allowed her to keep going to school, but what happened was um, they were really also pushing reading at that young age. And my daughter wasn't quite ready for that. She started coming home in tears saying, I hate school. Um, so the, I actually decided to pull her out and homeschool for a couple of years. Again, not my plan, um, but it allowed me to start learning about different educational philosophies. And I learned a lot about Reggio Emilia where the environment is a third teacher and Waldorf where there's a nice rhythm to the day. I learned a lot about Finland where kids were in the river dissecting fish to learn about ecology and how their schooling was more perceived to be more laid back. However, they were scoring way higher in science and math. So that, that really fascinated me. At the same time, um, I live on 12 acres of woodland and we have about 50 acres of conservation surrounding us. So we, we live kind of in the boonies. I take a shortcut sometimes through a neighborhood to get to our property. And there's a lot of children um, in that neighborhood. I know because I have friends that live there and have children. And one day it just dawned on me that I never saw kids playing outside. And I kept thinking, where are the children? Why are they not biking to each other's homes? Um, so I knew I wanted to do something with getting kids outdoors. I thought it was in the form of nature classes until I ran one. And I had a parent come up to me with her son in hand and said, can you please tell my son why the leaves change color? And I, I was trying to remember my science classes and I said, I think it has something to do with a pigment in the leaf. Um, but you know, it really was a good reflection moment for me on, you know, um, you know, I'm not a teacher and I'm not an environmentalist or a naturalist. And really at the time, um, those were more the professionals that were running nature programming. And I kept thinking, what does an occupational therapist have anything to do with nature programs? And then it dawned on me that the occupation of a child is play. And outdoor play is a really important occupation that many of us valued and cherished. Um, whenever I ask adults, what's your fondest memories growing up? Often they will tell you about a time playing outdoors. However, it's really at risk in ways like um, that I never, I never thought possible. And so really what I've learned over the years is that my mission is um, to restore the occupation of outdoor play and enrich that experience for children, to make it as authentic as possible. Um, I believe true occupation is a choice and true play is the same way, it must be a choice. And so we allow um, different play opportunities out in the woods um, that are directed by the child. So fast forward a little bit. Um, I had a friend suggest I do summer camps because she thought I would have more parents sign up for the programming if they could drop their children off. So I said, okay, I'll do it for one summer and I'll do one week of camp. And she said, oh no, in order to market this, you need to do three weeks of camp at least. So I did three weeks, the bare minimum. I went to University of New Hampshire and took graduate OT students. And I, because I thought what a unique way for them to see, you know, nature for its therapeutic value. 
So I had no idea what I was getting into. And I was essentially running, um, I was going to run a business and run a program um, by myself with some helpers, some volunteers. Uh, typically, therapists, as you know, work one on one or small groups. So we're not used to directing a larger group of children. So after the three weeks of camp, I was completely exhausted. Um, I felt like I was putting on a giant birthday party every single day. Um, so I said, okay, I'm all done with that. That was fun. Um, but what happened is those four OT students went back to the university and told other students. And so we had 14 volunteers the next year. And then I had two teachers reach out asking if they could help with Timbernook. And it wasn't called Timbernook at the time, but my program. And so I said, okay, I'll do it one more year. <laughs> and um, so one of them said, what if we did stories out in the woods, such as Three Little Pigs? And, you know, we could sit at tables and we could have a little house out of bricks, a little, make a little house out of sticks, um, a little house out of hay after reading the story, Three Little Pigs. And I thought that's, that's a great idea. But what if, you know, um, thinking as an OT, we had real bricks out in the woods. Um, we had bales of hay and we had piles of very large sticks so that the kids are engaging the muscles and senses. Um, and living and breathing the story and building their own homes. And she's like, yes. And so that, that really shifted the programming from being very adult directed activities to being occupation driven, very experiential. They have an experience out there, but they don't necessarily bring a product home. Um, they leave their, their three little pig homes out in the woods. And so, um, I basically every year after that, I would say, yes, I'll do it one more year. Um, but what happened after that was um, about three years into the program, I released my summer camps in February because in the American camp culture, you have to release it way ahead in order to um, have your registration on time. And at nine o'clock, I opened the registration. By 9.02, I had wait lists for all four weeks. And I, um, I had two parents call me in tears saying, hey, my kid got into your program, but didn't get in this year. What are you going to do about that? And I said, I don't know, because this wasn't my plan. I really wanted to stay home. I didn't, wasn't planning on working. Um, I did not want to run summer camps all summer long. And so what happened next was I had an occupational therapist reach out and a physical therapist and say, this is very unique for our profession. Do you mind if we replicate your program? And so that's when I realized that this wasn't, this wasn't about me at all. Um, this was something, this was a gift that had been given and um, I needed to share it. So I met with business mentors um, on a higher level who helped me to license this kind of program and to, to bring it to other people so that other people could run this kind of program. Um, what I was going to do was I was gonna market to New England. And as you're learning, my plan always gets shot out of the water every time. Um, so about a year into the program, I wrote an article called Why Kids Fidget and what we can do about it. And we'll talk about this in just a moment. That article went incredibly viral on my own blog. Um, and that um, basically got picked up by the Washington Post and then that exploded. Um, they sold world rights to that article. So Times of India, Jerusalem Post picked it up. That's how I did a TED talk for Johnson & Johnson on their main stage. And that's how Balance and Barefoot came about. So it's all about um, this message that we're going to talk about now on how we're overly restricting children's um, ability to move and play in very big ways and how it's really affecting their development. So that's how Timbernook um, is now in Australia and um, throughout Canada. It's in the UK and throughout the United States. Um, and we also um, now work with schools and um, they have special Timbernook time as part of the curriculum. In 2012, I got asked to observe a fifth grade classroom. Um, it was a, it's a local charter school. It's really well respected for art and music. They have a half an hour recess session, which is actually pretty good compared to some schools it might have 15 minutes to 20 minute recess sessions. But this teacher um, was, she felt like she couldn't teach the children. They were fidgeting in extreme ways. Um, she knew I was an OT and she said, come give me some movement, movement ideas. This was before Timbernook. And so I went in 
and observe the children. They were leaning back in their chairs at extreme angles. Um, so, so there was only one point of contact with their chair to the ground, um, multiple children. Uh, one child was rocking in his chair back and forth. Um, another one was hitting his head with a plastic water bottle. Um, other children were getting up to sharpen their pencil. Another child was asking to go to the bathroom. And as I watched them, I realized there was one little girl in that room who really wasn't fidgeting in that much. So I asked her, what do you do for fun? And she said, I, I do dance and gymnastics almost every day. So this will make sense in a minute. I um, wanted to implement a therapeutic dance program with a colleague of mine that would get these kids moving in all different ways. And so we decided to do a pilot study and look at before and after, you know, the effects of this program. So first, what we did was we looked at their core strength, we looked at their stomach muscles and back muscles, and we compared that to our standardized norms from 1984. So the averages of core strength from back then. And then we had them, um, we looked for a normal balance reaction. So we had them spin in circles and um, with their eyes open to one side that works on one inner ear. And then we had them spend 10 times to the other direction to work on the, on the other inner ear. Then we had them close their eyes and spin. And you take away the visual piece, you're really igniting that vestibular, that balance sense. And then after we were looking for nystigma, so we were looking at, did they have a, a vigorous eye response? Were the eyes moving back and forth? And what we found is, that, um, which they should have, that a lot of the kids, when we looked for a normal balance reaction and combine that with a core strength compared to 1984, we found only one out of every um, 12 children, only one out of every 12 children could meet both norms. Uh, so that was very alarming and not, it was unexpected. So that really prompted me to start interviewing veteran teachers that had been around for at least 30 years. And I thought, were they seeing what we were seeing in the field of occupational therapy? Were they seeing a rise in sensory and motor issues? And it doesn't matter where I have um, gone to speak over the years, I, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, um, it's the same thing. They're seeing a, a rise. It's not as profound in some countries, but they're seeing a rise in these issues. So the number one issue teachers were reporting that again have been around for at least 30 years was they saw a decrease in a, um, the ability to attend. So for instance, one teacher said in the past, she was able to teach the whole classroom as a whole in the early 80s. And she said, maybe one or two children had struggled with attention back then. She said, now on a good day, at least eight of those 26 kids are struggling to attend. And she actually had to change the way she taught. So she used to, um, again, teach as a whole classroom. And now she breaks them up into small groups to engage them in a task. Poor posture, physical therapists and chiropractors are seeing this pre-adolescent posturing. So this curvature of the upper body at an earlier age. Um, they're also treating back pain at an earlier age as well. This makes sense to me because if your core strength isn't quite where it should be and you're carrying these really heavy backpacks around, that's an issue. But another huge issue is a lot of kids are um, looking at devices, right? That's putting you in a forward head position. And a lot of children are sitting for a good portion of their day. Um, I sat in for a research project um, about a couple of years ago where an occupational therapist was getting her FAOTA um, um, degree or initials, um, a higher level initials for OTs. And she found that kids were sitting on average in America about nine hours a day. Um, so that's a lot of sitting. So that's bound to change posture because certain muscles will shorten that shouldn't shorten and certain muscles will lengthen that should not be lengthened. Another issue is falling. It's not one I believed until I saw it, but a kid literally fell out of the chair and onto the ground. Um, I remember the teacher saying, that's the third time today, please get back in your seat. Uh, director of a local preschool, um, she had been a director for 40 years and she said, I don't remember this being an issue in the past but kids are literally running into each other 
more frequently and running into the even the walls and falling a couple times a day out of their chair. Increased aggression, but not bullying per se, but almost that the kids can't keep their hands off each other. So recess monitors are reporting that kids, um, you know, are using more force when playing with other children. For instance, when they go to play games like tag, they're hitting harder. Um, and what's happening in some schools is they're starting to ban tag and um, or create special rules like two finger touch rules or using noodles, that sort of thing. So again, all this will make sense in a minute. Uh, another report is a lot of teachers are seeing kids become much more emotional, um, crying at the drop of the hat, much more easily frustrated. There's been a lot of research about the rise in anxiety and depression. The pandemic has only made this worse um, and play is changing. So recess monitors um, said in the past, they remember a, a lot more imaginatory type play. And now they're seeing a lot of more structured play, like playing on and off a play structure or playing a game um, such as tag if they're allowed to. So what's happening is a lot of kids are coming up to kindergarten uh, less prepared than ever before. Um, their core strength isn't quite where it should be. Emotional regulation is starting to become an issue. Even hands, things such as hand strength isn't quite the same. Um, there is a standardized test that we have. Um, I remember when I wrote the book, they were starting to think about changing the standardized norms because a lot of kids weren't meeting the strength requirements. And so everyone was popping up as having issues with strength. And they were wondering if they should change that so that more kids wouldn't appear to have um, issues. And so they actually, they actually have changed it, um, the norms, which is interesting. Um, versus keeping them to the same standards of the strength in the past. So, um, so we're expecting a higher level, but we're also expecting a higher level, right? So I remember in kindergarten, you know, we don't, didn't always use pencils and now we're expecting kids to use pencils, um, expecting kids to read at a younger age. And so again, these ch children are less prepared than ever before but we're expecting a really a higher level. And so a lot of children are getting pulled out for extra services from a, from a very early age. So why is this happening? What is going on? Uh, increased technology is a really big issue. And I guess I didn't realize how bad it was until um, recently I volunteered, I'm volunteering to do a health class for my own children's school. And I didn't realize how attached they were to their devices because my children don't um, really get a phone or anything till high school. And so um, these middle school kids were, you thought I would have taken their life away. I had asked them to do one day without screens. And I remember a child looking at me and saying, um, I'm afraid to be alone with my thoughts. And so I was like, wow, it's so interesting that they can't even take a break from it or feel like they can't take a break from it. So that's replacing a lot of times the video games and you know that technology is replacing their time with authentic play outdoors, um, real connection with other people. And um, the decrease in outdoor playtime is really what we're gonna focus on a lot right now. This part is really important. So um, I will make sure I take my time with it. But what's happening is, um, you know, if you think about Think about first, you guys can put this in the chat if you want. Think about how much outdoor play time you got, how much free play time you got outside growing up. Um, let's say elementary age. Think about, did you walk to school when you were a child? Did you walk home from school? How long was your recess sessions back then? And then how much outdoor play time did you get when you got home? And give me a total amount of time that you think you played outdoors. And you can put that in the chat. as much as I wanted, two to three hours, three hours, feels like all day, eight to 10 hours until dark, yeah. So the, the most, um, so usually the response I get for this can clearly range based on the person, but the average responses I get between four to six hours of outdoor playtime on, on a typical school day. 
Now think about child that you know, um, it could be a child that you work with in your family. Um, it could be a child in your family, excuse me, or a child that you work with and think about how much outdoor playtime they get on a typical school day. Think about, do they walk to school? Do they walk home from school? How long is their recess session? Do they get more than one? And then how much outdoor playtime do they get after school? And give me a total amount for that. Two hours, maybe one to two, one hour, one hour, a few hours, 20 minutes. All right, so the typical response I get for that is about 45 minutes to an hour and a half. Um, and the research is um, about 48 minutes. However, I, th I think that is actually less, I think, because my research is from like 2015. Um, I think the most recent thing I've heard is sometimes it's closer to like four to seven minutes, it can be. Um, however, I think, I don't know how accurate that is because I feel like recess is usually like 15 minutes. Um, so it can vary again, um, greatly, but usually the response I get is about 45 minutes to an hour and a half. So if you think about that four to six hours in the past of outdoor playtime to let's say 48 minutes, that's a significant change. That alone is a significant change to the environment, um, that they're in, you know, so, you know, digging in the dirt for hours to maybe 48 minutes if they're lucky. So it's bound to affect child development. A lot of children, as we talked about, are sitting for hours a day, um, you know, sometimes up to nine hours a day, which is crazy if you think about it. Uh, a lot of kids are being driven to school um, and they're in this upright position. They're sitting for days at a, they're sitting for hours at a time and they're in this upright position. Maybe they're dri being driven home or they're um, signed up for events after school. Uh, sometimes they do sports. Sometimes the sports like are like soccer or running and you're still kind of in this upright position a lot. And um, what really needs to happen is that children need to be able to move in all different ways. So they need to be able to move in kind of vigorous ways, spinning in circles. They need to go upside down. Um, they need to climb trees, but they need to get that head moving in all different ways. And so um, basically inside your inner ear are little hair cells. And when we move in that vigorous ways, the fluid moves back and forth and stimulates those hair cells. And that develops your vestibular sense. And that sense is key to all the other senses. So if children are being overly restricted, if they're not moving enough throughout the day, um, that can impact their vestibular sense. And that sense um, is key to what we call sensory integration. It's a unifying sense. It helps organize the brain and lay that foundation for learning. A lot of kids are walking around with an underdeveloped vestibular sense. It's very much like the muscular sense where, you know, if you want to get really buff, you have to uh, lift weights or do push-ups, that sort of thing, a couple times a week in order to create change to your muscles. The same with the cardio sense. You need to do aerobic exercise in order to create change to your heart and lungs at least three to five times a week to um, not only strengthen that, but to even maintain it. The vestibular sense is the same way. You really need to move in all different ways um, on a frequent basis in order for that system to be really strong and even to maintain it. Um, it's one reason why adults can't tolerate rides when they're older. They might feel nauseous. Um, if you go on spinny ride or roller coasters, maybe you can't to tolerate those anymore. Um, it's because a lot of us are not moving as much as we did in years past. And so um, that system can weaken. It's uh, the reason why adults, um, occupational therapists will advocate for adults to keep moving, especially the geriatric population in order to prevent falls and hip fractures. Um, but the problem is children are um, becoming more and more unsafe at an earlier age. So kids are literally falling out of their chairs at school. And that should be a really big red flag to us that they need to move more than we're allowing them to. So I wanna explain the sense um, a little bit more so you can really see how important this is. 
One thing that vestibular system does when you get plenty of movement opportunities is it really helps you to know where your body is in space. It helps you to get from point A to point B safely, um, to get on and off that playground structure effectively, to stay in your seat without falling out. And the way we treat this as therapists is we often have them spin. We have them spin in circles. We have swings hanging from our ceilings when you go in our clinics for a reason. We literally position them in all different directions and spin them in different ways. And that really helps them to know where their body is in, um, when navigating their environments. So sometimes I'll see an adult um, see a child spinning and say, don't spin, you're gonna get dizzy. Um, or get down from that rock, you're going to get hurt. Get, don't climb that tree, you're going to get hurt, that sort of thing. And when we constantly stop them from moving in those um, ways, um, we, we can sometimes become the barrier to that neurological sensory development that really needs to happen. So we do need to allow them to move in all different ways for that, for that system to be strong and, and, and maintain the strength as well. The other thing that the stibular sense does is it turns a reticular activating system on in the brain to pay attention. And so that's why um, those kids were fidgeting in that classroom. So what they're doing is they're moving their body back and forth. They're um, igniting that vestibular sense to turn the brain on so they can tune in. And what do we say sometimes as adults, right? When kids are all fidgeting. So we might say, you know, sit still, um, you know, don't move, pay, pay attention. Um, but clearly those kids needed to move in that moment, but, but they also need to move throughout the day so they can gain the skill of attention. The other thing that system does is it supports all six eye muscles um, to work as a team. So it acts like a tripod, um, like as if it was a tripod for cam camera to stabilize the eyes so those eyes can work as a team. So that's really important for reading and writing and those sort of skills. So again, it helps you know where your body is in space. It helps you to pay attention. It helps stabilize the eyes for reading and writing and scanning. Um, but it also helps with um, emotional regulation and arousal level. Um, so sometimes um, if a kid gets really, we call them really hyper or off the wall, you know, it helps them to naturally bring that back down again. If they get really mad and frustrated, again, to naturally bring that back down again. We're at the point where um, teachers are, you know, having to feel like they need to do special exercises. So doing yoga and Pilates and, you know, dimming the lights to get children to um, be regulated and ready to pay attention. Um, but I would argue if children got plenty of outdoor playtime um, for hours, you know, they wouldn't necessarily need those special, special exercises to pay attention um, or to regulate the emotions. They, you know, they would have that skill. Um, and this is, I'm talking about like the general public. So the, obviously there's genetic things, um, but even children with, with genetic issues, you're going to see a lot of the um, hyperactivity and all those issues lessen when they get plenty of this kind of input and movement as well. It's what we do for treatment. So um, when that article went very, really viral of why kids need to move more, um, some articles came out uh, about, okay, we're gonna fix a problem by putting them on bouncy balls. Um, and that's going to fix the underlying issue. Um, there was an article that came out where children were all sitting in their desks and they had pedals where they were biking. And um, so that would supposedly help with attention. Why now do you think knowing the information that you know, is it not gonna fix the underlying issue to sit on bouncy balls or to pedal? So think about that for a minute. So the issue is um, these children are still upright, right? So they're not gonna create change to the vestibular sense per se. It will help some children in the moment because when you're moving, you're igniting that vestibular sense to tune in. Um, however, with some children, when you start moving, that activity level will, go, will go, actually go up and they can become dysregulated and, and all over the place. So it doesn't even work for all children. And it also won't create change to the vestibular sense. So we still really need 
for them to move in all different ways. Um, we basically need to allow them to move in ways that make adults gasp. We want them to go upside down. We want them to go um, roll down the hill. We want them to climb trees, um, jump off things. We want them to constantly challenge their senses and their muscles in order for them to develop and get stronger over time. One other sense that's being affected is the proprioceptive system. And that's the senses in the joints and muscles. And that tells you where your limbs are in relation to each other. Uh, but it also helps you to know how much force to use when playing games like tag without hitting too hard, or maybe holding a baby chick without squeezing it, or, um, or frogs. Um, being able to write with a pencil without breaking the lead over and over. Maybe you're not writing hard enough. Um, so the way we treat that is you'll hear therapists talk about heavy work, you know, resistance to joints and muscles, push pull activities. Um, and if you think about outdoor play again, they're naturally doing this. So, um, you know, picking up big sticks to build a fort is give, giving you nice senses to the joints and muscles, climbing a tree. When you're climbing a tree, you're getting nice resistance to the joints and muscles, picking up a heavy um, rock um, is also giving you nice senses to the joints and muscles. And all of that helps a child, again, to know where their body limbs are in relation to each other. And again, how much force to use when playing games like tag. So instead of banning things like tag, we really want to understand why is this happening in the first place and to do something about it. Um, Another issue is a lot of kids are on technology, as we talked about, you know, they might be playing video games. Um, and so you're not getting resistance to the joints and muscles when you're doing that. Um, and so if that's all they do, if they go to school and then they are doing technology and they're not playing outdoors or they're not doing any sports of some sort, then that can definitely affect the proprioceptive sense. And so we, we will definitely see issues with that. So the more I observe children in a classroom setting, in a clinic, traditional clinic setting, and then watching children out in the woods, I started to realize that it, outdoors is the ultimate sensory experience. And that we just, we just can't replicate what we can get outdoors inside as much as we try, we cannot. It's just, it takes it to a whole different level. It's richer, it's more challenging. Um, and so I'm gonna show you some videos and some images to start you thinking about this. So the first thing that happens when you step outdoors is multiple senses are engaged, right? So you have the wind, um, you might have sun beating down on you. It could be raining, snow, um, you know, the ground is uneven. So when you walk indoors, often you don't have to even think about it. Whereas when you step outdoors, you're constantly um, adjusting your body and your muscles to the environment. So multiple synapses are firing when you step outdoors and your chance for that integration of the senses is higher, that organization of the brain. Um, the ideal state for sensory integration to happen is to be in a calm but alert state of mind. So again, you look at the colors outside and often you'll see you know, greens and browns and blues. Uh, we'll paint our preschools those colors for, for calming input, you know, our prisons. Um, you go for a massage and you hear crashing waves. You hear, hear bird sounds. All of that is designed to um, give you calming stimuli. So even certain um, smells of trees will reduce the cortisol levels in the brain. However, you're still alert, aren't you, right? So you are, you know, it's uneven out, outside. Um, when you walk from point A to point B, you're constantly having to, um, you know, adjust your body or looking around you. There might be an animal running by. So you're often in this calm but alert state of mind. And again, that happens to be ideal for that integration, that organization of the brain. We want to think about what percentage of time are children in an environment conducive to that and then what percentage of time are they in an environment that could be disorganizing or we call it dysregulating. So they could be in an environment where there's a lot of posters on the walls. Maybe children are really close, like they're in a classroom and there's a lot of children in a small amount of space and that could be disorganizing to some children. Um, the noises could be level. All of that can be um, troublesome for children with sensory issues. 
also a lot of our environments, there's a lot of transitions. So we're constantly adjusting them and stopping them every 45 minutes to an hour. And so that can be a lot for children to handle. The more I took a look at some of our sensory clinics too, I really started to just take a step back and rethink things a little bit. Um, I remember when I first posted this, I had a lot of OTs mad at me, <laughs> but um, it's really important because um, you know the, well, these are both considered a sensory experience. So this is a sensory balance beam. I, some of you might be familiar with them. Um, and then on the right is a child with walking on a sense, um, walking on a log. And so both are considered a sensory experience. However, if our true objective is to create change to the senses, which experience do you think will be more conducive to that? So I'm gonna have you guys um, kind of write right into the chat on what is happening on the right-hand side that you're not getting on the left-hand side. So on the right, yep, someone's saying that you can actually get wet and dirty on the right. So you see dirt on the feet, different smells. Yeah, all the things we talked about too, right? So the wind, um, the sunshine, it's a natural sensory experience. Um, it's free, which is great. It's not predictable, right? So as you are walking on the log, um, it, the, the stimulation is gonna be, is gonna change as you walk, right? So it could be crunchy leaves, it could be moss. So you're integrating, uh, making new connections in the brain. Um, it's dynamic. So you're gonna actually work on dynamic balance versus it's gonna be more static on the left more motivating. Yeah. So what is truly meaningful to the child? Which one do you think they'll stay with longer? Sometimes on the right, I mean, on the left, there's this preconceived, we're doing this right now, right? Um, and when children have any sort of sensory issue, there's often anxiety tied to that. So this a little bit of we're doing this right now can often rise anxiety level in children with sensory issues. The one on the right is often a choice, right? So the child might stay on there for a minute. They might get off. There might be another child somewhere else. Um, it's, you know, again, play is a choice. And so um, that's another thing to think about when looking at these kind of sensory experiences. It's real. It's a, yeah. So just because you go barefoot on the plastic balance beam doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be walking on dirt after that. Um, it, you know, you're likely, if you're walking barefoot on the right-hand side, you're probably gonna be more, you're gonna generalize that over into a real environment more often. Very good. All right, so we're gonna look at another one. These are giant mud puddles on the left and compared to a sensory bin on the right. Again, there's nothing wrong with sensory bins and I do use them from time to time. However, if our true objective is to provide a sensory experience that creates change in the child, which one do you think will be more conducive to that and why? So same thing, if you want to put in the chat, what is happening on the left that you, you, you won't get on the right? So you got the natural space, yeah, large muscle. So whole body, yes, so that's a huge one. So it's a whole body immersion on the left um, head to toe sensory experience. Whereas on the right, you might hit, fit your hands in there, maybe your feet. Um, you're restricted again, aren't you? A certain amount of space. On the left, you have a, a very big space, right? So there's gonna be other children involved. You'll get more of that social piece going on. All the other stuff we talked about, wind, sunshine, smells of the mud. Um, you know, the, the noise of the um, birds around you, it's unpredictable. You can't see your feet. It's probably uneven under there. It's wet. Um, again, what is truly meaningful to the children? Which one do you think they'll stay with longer? So again, on the right, there's a little bit of a preconceived, we're doing a gardening thing. There's a little bit less, there's a lot less choice. On the left, you're gonna have endless possibilities for play. The adults could actually step back more on the left-hand side because the child, there's 
um, there's no need to tell them don't make a mess. Whereas on the right, you might be like telling them don't get the dirt out, you know, allow so and so to fit in there. So there's a lot less need for adult constant adult intervention on the left as well. All right, so I'm going to show you a video. Now, this is a Timbernook experience, an example of one. Um, the children were given the opportunity, everything's an opportunity, and it's all their choice to create a giant um, obstacle course over the, our, we have huge mud puddles here um, at our site. And we have a, a wooded area and then we have mud puddles in a different area. And um, we had materials out there and you know we don't say anything about, about the materials except they can use anything they see out there to design their course. So we'll just watch that. So um, go ahead and write in the chat box uh, any observations that you made of what the children are doing. What were some of the things you saw? So you saw opportunity for teamwork, problem solving, solving their own problems. Um, the adults were stepping back. So that's one thing with Timbernook um, is that we reduce adult presence out there because what we learned is if we, let's say kids are building a fort, if we were standing too close to them, what we've learned over the years is that they would start turning to the adult to seek constant adult reassurance. Is this okay? Is this okay? There was more tattling going on um, and they would look to us to give them play ideas. But when we backed up, and we got down low, so we're observing and supervising them, but we're not front and center, um, they would start turning to each other to solve their own problems and to initiate their own play ideas. It's something that we are not seeing children do enough is executive functioning, being able to initiate an idea and execute that play idea. So this is their opportunity to do so. Um, so you, yeah, a child was saying, oh, this is disgusting. So, you know, verbally processing the sensory experience, um, he, he would go out, go back in, go out, go back in. Um, there's a lot of social and language opportunities, a lot of communication, being mentally flexible with other people's ideas, whole body sensory experience. Um, there's, you know, engagement from, you know, I would say, I would argue that most of them were very engaged, even if it looked different for different kids. So some kids were sitting, some kids were observing, but they were all very interested in what was happening. And um, again, play is a choice. And so it will look different for different children. So really respecting that as well. Yeah, lots of joy and laughter too. Something again, that we really need today. So here's them testing it out. So just make any observations. Barefoot. 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 Barefo
All right, so I just wanna go over a couple last things and um, we'll wrap up the session. Um, so just being outdoors is therapeutic for children. A, a great example of that is bird sounds um, because what happens is you'll hear a bird tweet in one direction, a bird tweet behind you, another bird in the distance. And what happens is you're orienting yourself to those nature sounds around you. And that orientation piece is the basis for spatial awareness. So even just stepping outdoors and hearing those bird sounds and orienting yourself to the sounds around you will help with spatial awareness. Um, you know, a lot of kids don't want to get dirty. That's another um, issue that we're starting to see. And I was thinking about this one day. And if you think about it, um, you know, we hear about the brushing protocols, right? Um, help that deep pressure helps to override that light touch sense that can feel aversive for a lot of children. And um, if you think about playing on the beach for a minute where you are running your hands through the sand, but often you're also digging in the dirt and you're getting, you're naturally getting this deep pressure um, because there's a lot more space and you can get really deep with that. That helps to integrate that light touch sense. Um, and create change to the senses. Um, same with climbing trees, you often feel sap, it feels gross, but because you're when you're climbing, you're getting that resistance, that deep pressure, and that is helping to integrate that light touch sense. Building fort, same thing, um, you know, you're holding a dirty log, but um, you're also doing heavy work, you're getting that neurological pressure at the same time to integrate that light touch sense. Um, allowing babies to crawl on the ground. You know, they're getting that deep pressure while they're feeling that light versus touch sense. And so helping to override that. And so over time that helps to integrate that light touch sense that can feel aversive for children. And I thought, I keep thinking about the sensory box where, you know, often it's not deep, that very deep, right? So you're, you're kind of stimulating that light touch sense, but you're not getting that heavy work that you would get um, through outdoor play. So I really feel it's important to kind of keep that in mind um, when thinking about um, that light touch sense and, you know, really supporting outdoor play to help integrate that sense. Um, going barefoot, there's a lot of research about um, how going barefoot will help increase the muscles, little muscles in the feet and ankles. Um, I used to work with Vivo Barefoot and um, write some articles for them and they showed me pictures of what feet should really look like. Um, they're really flat, they're, the arch isn't high, but um, they showed research on how wearing those barefoot shoes where you're getting pressure in all different parts of your feet, it's helping to strengthen the muscles of the foot and the ankles. Um, so I think of outdoor play as cross training and the more children do it, the stronger they get, the more resilient, um, the more connections in the brain they're making. So I encourage you to really, um, allow for at least three hours of outdoor play for children on, on for any age, um, any given day. Um, remember that you got four to six hours on average growing up. So, you know, really bringing that back, um, taking time to allow for the authentic play where everything's a choice. Um, they can be supervised, but you can kind of phase yourself out over time is, is something that I think we need to prioritize, especially now more than ever. Um, this pandemic it has really heightened um, the, the importance of this work. I felt like this work was always really important and it's very therapeutic, but it's now critical and it's a lifeline for these children. They do need to connect with other children. They need to play in order to heal from this collective trauma that everyone's going through. Um, and so it's best done outdoors in a very rich, calming environment. So I would promote this in your schools. I would promote this through your practice. Um, you know, just seeing the joy in the kids out there every day when we work out there is, um, it's, it's invaluable. Um, we've had providers in tears. Um, kids forget about the pandemic and the fears of the world and they can just be children. So um, we are gonna have another session on November 4th at 12 p.m. to do question and answer because we had a feeling that we would want to get in as much content as possible and that it would leave you with a lot of questions. So we're gonna do another whole hour session on November 4th at 12 p.m. for question and answer. Okay, Angela, thank you so much. And yes, as Angela said, the link is in the Padlet. 
for you to, uh, you won't need to register. Um, we won't be offering additional CPDUs for that session. Um, it'll just be question and answer and as a follow up to what Angela has presented today. So Angela, we're getting great comments. We knew we would, fascinating information. Thanks so much and um, everyone will see you at 215. Thank you, Angela. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. Just a reminder, uh, the Padlet, I just put the link in once more time, one more time for the handouts for the this last session at 215 with um, Dr. Childress. See you in 15 minutes.